Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our beloved Heavenly Father, as we study today about the Mark of the Beast, part two, we ask for a special outpouring of your Holy Spirit and your grace upon us. This is not an easy subject to deal with, for there are many of those uh, individuals out there in the churches that are sincere, they love you with all their hearts, they just don't know the full truth about the change of day of worship and how it came into the Christian church. I just ask, Lord, that you will soften minds and hearts so that people might be able to see the truth as it is in Jesus. Help us to see, Lord, how the devil has deceived practically the whole Christian world into believing that the day of worship has been changed. I ask, Lord, that you will give us willing hearts, and we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. A question that many times comes up is whether anybody in the world has the mark of the beast yet. The fact is that no one now has the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is something that is given at the very end of human history. However, having said that, when messages are presented such as these, showing clearly from the Bible that the Sabbath is God's day of rest, and that Sunday is a day that entered through the back door, so to speak, through paganism into the Christian church, and an individual fails to make a decision, each time you say no to the Lord, it becomes more difficult to say yes to Him the next time. And so what you're doing is you're preparing yourself, if time lingers, eventually to receive the mark of the beast by rejecting the seal of God. So no one yet has received the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast will be received when an individual knowingly keeps Sunday as a day of rest, even though he or she knows that it's a day that God has not condoned, that God has not blessed, and they still insist on keeping it so that they can buy and sell, so that they will not be subjects of the death decree, then they will receive the mark of the beast. But decisions that we are making now will determine what our decision will be then. So it's important to hear the voice of God now. For our study today, I would like to do a little review of a very impressive prophecy that we find in Daniel chapter 7. And I'm not going to study, obviously, all the prophecy in this chapter. I'm just going to give you the highlights. I want you to see the sequence of powers that we have in this chapter. Daniel chapter 7 presents a sequence of world powers beginning with the days of the prophet Daniel. And I'm just going to give you the symbols and what they mean. In Daniel 7, we have a lion. That lion represents the kingdom of Babylon. Then we have a bear. The bear represents the kingdom that succeeded Babylon. It represents the Medes and the Persians. Then we have a leopard beast. The leopard beast represents the kingdom of Greece. Then we have a dragon beast. It's not called a dragon in Daniel chapter 7, but uh, it certainly acts like a dragon. It tramples and it has iron teeth and it destroys everything it finds in its way. And of course, that fourth beast represents the Roman Empire. But then we're told that from the head of that fourth beast come forth ten horns, which represent the kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was divided as a result of the barbarian invasions. By the way, this happened in the year 476. And then the Bible tells us that among these ten horns, and after these ten horns are in place, a little horn rises, and this little horn does some amazing things. It persecutes the saints of the Most High. It speaks blasphemous words against the Most High. It thinks it can change times and the law of God, and it rules for time, times, and the dividing of time. 
Now there can be no doubt as we examine the sequence of powers that this little horn represents the Roman church simply because we follow the sequence of powers. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the divided Roman Empire, and then in the divided Roman Empire which took place in the year 476, was finalized in the year 476, then you have the little horn that comes up and it rules for time times and the dividing of time which is equivalent to 1,000 260 days, but in prophecy days are equal to years. There's just no way around it. There's only one system in the world that arose from ancient Rome that ruled over a thousand years, and that is the Roman Catholic papacy. Now I want to dwell on one particular characteristic of the little horn. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. It says here, speaking about the little horn, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Let's just stop there for a moment. The pompous words in Revelation are identified as blasphemies. And the Bible identifies blasphemies as when a man claims to be God or have the powers of God, and when a mere man claims to be able to forgive sins. Now you know that the Roman Catholic Papacy claims that they have the vicar of Christ on earth, one who has the authority of Jesus Christ, who is God. And it's a system that claims to have the power to forgive sins. Also, you've heard, we've studied this, about the Inquisition the persecuting of those who were not in harmony with the church through the arm of the state. That's what this is talking about. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and then here's the characteristic I want to dwell on, and shall intend or shall think to change times and law. And then it tells us that he would attempt to do this for time times and the dividing of time, that is for 1,000 260 years. Now in our la last lecture we studied the quotations from several theologians. These theologians of the Roman Catholic Church told us that the change of the Sabbath to Sunday was performed by the church. Some of them even say that the change was made by the Pope. It's not talking about a particular Pope, it's talking about a succession of popes, by the papacy, in other words. They unabashedly say so. They say that the day was changed by the Roman Catholic Church or by the papacy. Now somebody might say, well, pastor, you know, those are quotations from theologians. And even though theologians of the Catholic Church are important, what evidence do you have of higher ups in the Roman Church that say the same thing as these theologians. Well, perhaps the most respected person in the world until recently was Pope John Paul II, highly respected all over the world for his moral views. On May 31, 1998, Pope John Paul II published an apostolic letter. An apostolic letter is a letter that he writes to the religious leaders of the church, giving them counsel. The name of this apostolic letter was Dies Domini, which means the Lord's Day. And what I'm going to share with you is many of the aspects that we find in this apostolic letter, Dies Domini. Now allow me to make a note of clarification as we begin. And that is that what I'm going to share with you has nothing to do with John Paul II as a person. We're not going to get into personalities here. What I'm going to deal with is I am going to compare his views in his apostolic letter with what the Bible says. What we're going to do 
is we're going to discuss things theologically and we're going to leave the personal aspect out of the question. So we're going to study his theological views in Dies Domini as compared with the Bible. And we're going to do it in question and answer form. Now here's the first question. According to the Bible, which day did God bless and sanctify, and which day in the Bible is called the Lord's Day? Well, I can answer biblically very clearly with Scripture. There's no doubt whatsoever that the seventh day Sabbath is the day that God blessed and sanctified. And there's no doubt biblically that the Sabbath is the Lord's Day. You say, where in the Bible do we find this? Let's read several verses. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis 2 verses 2 and 3. It's explicit. By the way, somebody might say, well, you know, the Sabbath was made for the Jews, and the Sabbath was made to point forward to Jesus, who was going to die on the cross, and He was going to be our rest. The fact is, what I'm going to read now actually is describing something that existed before there was any Jew. Before there was any sin, there was no need of any cross, there was no need of redemption. It's part of God's original plan. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. Three times it speaks of the seventh day, and we're told that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Is that explicit and clear enough? I mean, there's no way around it. Now let's go to the fourth commandment of God's law. Do you think the Ten Commandments are still binding today? You know, some people think that they're the Ten Suggestions or the Ten Recommendations. The fact is that no Christian in the world today would say that the Ten Commandments are no longer important. Although some churches say that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross, and then they'll turn right around and they'll say, we need to have the Ten Commandments in our courtrooms. Now you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth. They were either nailed to the cross or they were not nailed to the cross, period. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Which is the Lord's day? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. See, it's a possessive, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested, which day? The seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That means He made it holy. Question, which is the Lord's day according to the fourth commandment? It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Which number day is it? It is the seventh day. What did God do with the seventh day Sabbath? He blessed and He what? Sanctified it. Notice Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Mark 2, 27 and 28. Let's notice who Jesus said the Lord's day is. And He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That's why the Sabbath was made after man, because it was made for the benefit of man. If God had made the Sabbath first and then man afterwards, He would have been making man for the Sabbath. And so it says 
the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of Sunday. That's not what the text says. It says, therefore the Lord is what? The Son of Man is Lord of the what? Of the Sabbath. So if Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, what is the Lord's day? I mean a child can understand this. The Lord's day is the Sabbath. By the way, the only day in the Bible that God claims as His is the Sabbath. Notice Isaiah 58 verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, what does God call the Sabbath? My holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Moses, no, no, no. It says, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor Him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. What is the Lord's day? The Lord's day is the Sabbath. What number day is the Sabbath? The seventh day. What did God do with the seventh day? He blessed and sanctified it. Now I want you to see what John Paul II said in Dies Domini. And I'm going to mention the paragraph because this document is divided into paragraphs. This is what he says. Unabashedly, in the first place, therefore, Sunday is the day of rest because it is the day blessed by God and made holy by Him, set apart from the other days, other days to be among all of them the Lord's day. Did you catch that? Where does the Bible say that Sunday is the Lord's day? Where does it say anywhere that God made Sunday holy and God blessed Sunday? Nowhere. You can look from Genesis to Revelation. You will find no verse where it says that Sunday is holy. You will uniformly find that Sabbath is the Lord's day. Sabbath is the day that God sanctified and blessed. This is an outright untruth. By the way, if Jesus or the apostles had changed the Sabbath to Sunday, there would have been an uproar among the Jews. Allow me to show you, share this quotation from Sam Bakioki, who's written extensively about the Sabbath. And by the way, uh, Sam Bakioki died just recently. Uh, he wrote a very good book titled From Sabbath to Sunday that it would be good for everyone to read because there he gives the historical evidence of how Sabbath was changed to Sunday. It wasn't biblical. It was several historical circumstances that took place. And here in this quotation, which is in his internet publication, Issues for Friday, August 7, 1998, he says this, If Paul or any other apostle had attempted to promote the abandonment of the Sabbath, a millenarian institution deeply rooted in the religious consciousness of the people, and the adoption instead of, sun, instead of Sunday observance, there would have been considerable opposition on the part of Jewish Christians, as was the case with reference to the circumcision. Do you remember that when circumcision was abolished, there was an uproar among the Jews, and they had to call a council in Jerusalem? He continues saying, the absence of any echo of Sabbath Sunday controversy in the New Testament is a most telling evidence that the introduction of Sunday observance is a post-apostolic phenomenon. In other words, it came in after the days of the apostles. Now I want to ask another question. Which is the day that stands at the very heart of all worship. Let's let the Bible tell us. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. 
Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now listen, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The first angel's message calls us to worship whom? To worship the Creator. Now my question is, where does the language from the first angel's message come from? This language, worship Him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This language comes from Exodus 20 and verse 11, and it comes ultimately from Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. I want you to notice Exodus 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice both the text in Exodus 20 verse 11 and the text in Revelation 14 verse 7 bring to view the Creator of the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything that is in them. And the fourth commandment says that the sign of the Creator is what? His holy Sabbath. So let me ask you, which day is at the very heart of all worship? The Sabbath. By the way, in our last lecture we read Isaiah 66 verses 22 and 23, where it says that when we get uh, to the new earth, after God has created a new heavens and a new earth, we will come from new moon to new moon. That means from month to month, because we're going to eat from the tree of life. We'll come from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord. In other words, we're going to come on Sabbath to worship before the Lord because He has created a new heavens and a new earth. It will be the sign of a new creation. In other words, at the heart of all worship is the Sabbath because the Sabbath identifies the Creator. But what does John Paul II say in Dies Domini? Paragraph 19 of his document. Listen to this. The intimate bond between Sunday and the resurrection of the Lord is strongly emphasized by all of the churches of East and West. He's saying that there's a link between Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus. And this link is clear in the churches in the East and in the West. In other words, the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. He continues saying, In the tradition of the Eastern churches in particular, every Sunday is the Anastasimos Hemera. That means the day of the resurrection. And this is why it stands at the heart of all worship. What stands at the heart of all worship according to John Paul II? It's not the Sabbath of creation. And by the way, Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath as well. Jesus was the creator. He rested the seventh day. Jesus said it is finished on the cross and he rested in the tomb on the seventh day. When he creates a new heavens and a new earth, we will rest on the seventh day. The Bible is clear. John Paul II says, in the churches of East and West, Sunday is at the very heart of worship. Is it surprising that the beast demands worship on Sunday and imposes the mark, which is the observance of Sunday as the day of rest, as the sign of his authority? Here's another question. What is the distinguishing mark of God's people? Well, the Bible says that the distinguishing mark of God's people is the Sabbath. Notice Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. God says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sundays. No, that's not what it says. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. How do we know the Lord who makes us holy or sanctifies us? What is the sign? The sign is the Sabbath. 
Notice Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. God says, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. What is the sign that shows that we are the subjects of the Lord our God? The Sabbath, according to the Bible. What does John Paul II say in Dies Domini? Paragraph 21. He appeals to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, if you let the Bible explain itself, what is the Lord's day? The Sabbath. You see, but he says the Lord's day there is, there is Sunday. Do you know why he says that? He says that because at the end of the second century, in the apocryphal gospel of Peter, it's an apocryphal book, it says there that the Lord's day is Sunday. But it's not until the end of the second century. Now let me put this into some perspective so that you can understand the time frame. The first century covers from the year 1 till the year 99. The second century goes from the year 100 till the year 199. Now the book of Revelation was written, according to most scholars, around the year 95. So I want you to notice that the apocryphal gospel of Peter was written towards the end of the second century, a hundred years after the book of Revelation was written. And so it's not fair to take the meaning of the Lord's Day a hundred years later and project that back into the book of Revelation. In other words, the meaning of the expression Lord's Day in the apocryphal gospel of Peter does not necessarily mean the same as in the book of Revelation. Now let's notice. He says the book of Revelation gives evidence of the practice of calling the first day of the week the Lord's Day. It says no such thing. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10 does not identify which day it is. It simply calls it the Lord's Day. By letting the Bible explain itself, the Lord's Day is the seventh day of the week, Sabbath. Now notice what he continues saying. This, that is Sunday observance, would now be a characteristic distinguishing Christians from the world around them. According to John Paul II, what is the sign that distinguishes Christians from the world? Sunday. Notice what he says in paragraph 30. Given its many meanings and aspects, and its link to the very foundations of the faith, the celebration of the Christian Sunday, listen to that, the celebration of the Christian Sunday remains on the threshold of the third millennium an indispensable element of our Christian what? Identity. Notice what he says in paragraph 7. Sunday is a day which is at the very heart of the Christian life. So according to John Paul II, what is the distinguishing sign between God and His people that distinguishes them from the world? It's Sunday. But the Bible says that the distinguishing sign is the Sabbath. Now let's ask another question. Where has God placed His seal? We studied this in our last lecture. The seal of God is found in the fourth commandment because it has the three characteristics of a seal. It has His name, His office or function, and the territory over which He rules. Very clearly, the Sabbath is God's seal. Notice Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord, that's His name, made, that's His function, He's the Creator, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That is His territory. Now I want you to notice what John Paul II says contains the seal of God. He's quoting the great uh, Roman Catholic theologian, St. Augustine, and notice what he says. St. Augustine notes in turn, therefore the Lord too, listen to this, has placed His seal on this day, that is on Sunday, which is the third day after the Passion. So according to John Paul II, which day has God's seal? Sunday has God's seal. What does the Bible say contains God's seal? Sabbath contains God's seal. 
Now, if I were to ask you the question, which is the day above all other days, what would your answer be? No-brainer. The Sabbath is the day above all other days. Does Genesis indicate that, that Sabbath is the day above all other days? It's the only day that has a name and a number. It's the seventh day, and it's called the Sabbath. It's the only day that God blessed. It's the only day that God sanctified. It's the only day that God rested. It's the day that Jesus rested in the tomb. It's the only day that God calls His. It's the only day in which manna did not fall. Which is the day above all days? There is no doubt whatsoever, biblically, that the day above all days is the Sabbath. But what does John Paul II say in Dies Domini? Paragraph 25. In effect, Sunday is the day above all other days, which summons Christians to remember the salvation which was given them in baptism and which has made them new in Christ. And in paragraph 55, he says, Blessed be he, and this is very interesting, he says, Blessed be he who has raised the great day of Sunday above all other days. Now my question is, did God raise Sunday above all other days? No, the beast did. So he's saying, Blessed be he who raised Sunday above all other days. And if he did it, He's the one that is supposed to be what? Blessed. That's blasphemy. The Bible tells us that the day above all other days is the seventh day Sabbath. That's the testimony of Scripture. Now let's ask another question. Did the adoption of Sunday as the day of rest have anything to do with pagan worship of the sun god. For this, I want to go back to what we talked about in our last lecture, Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. You remember that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and there was a group of leaders in the temple, and they had their backs to the temple, and they were worshiping the sun. You remember that? They were worshiping the sun to the east, and there was a group that were sighing and crying because of this abomination and other abominations that were being committed in the temple. Let's read about it. Ezekiel 8, 16 and 17. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit these abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have turned, returned to provoke me to anger. Now let me ask you, did John Paul II make any connection between the pagan worship of the sun and Christian worship on Sunday? I want to read an amazing statement that he makes in Dies Domini, paragraph 27. You remember last time that um, I asked the question whether worshiping the sun is the same thing as worshiping on the day of the sun? Remember that? And I showed that in principle, worshiping on the day of the sun is the same thing as worshiping the sun. In principle, it's the same. Because God didn't make the sun for worship. If you worship the sun, which is a secular object, you're practicing idolatry. If you make a day of worship for worship that God didn't make for worship, and you're using it as a day of worship, that's idolatry, because God didn't make it for worship. It's a man-made day for worship. Are you following me? Listen to what he says in paragraph 27. Wise pastoral intuition suggested to the church the Christianization of the notion of Sunday as the day of the sun. In other words, the day of the sun, he's saying, was Christianized. It was adopted into Christianity, and Sunday became the day of Christians as well as the day of pagans. I don't say it. John Paul II says, says it. 
And by the way, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Vatican Museum. It is an amazing sight to see. The one thing that amazed me more than anything else is to see the number of sunbursts that are found there in the Vatican Museum. Not only in the Vatican Museum, but in Roman Catholic cathedrals and churches. There are sunbursts over the heads of saints. There are sunbursts on the altars, on the glass-stained windows, on the works of art, on the chalices, on the vestments. There's sunbursts, rays coming from all over the place. This does not come from the Bible. This comes from ancient paganism. And by the way, Roman Catholic authors have made it very clear that they realize that many of the practices of the church came directly from paganism. And in Dies Domini, John Paul II is admitting that the day of the sun was Christianized. By the way, it came in in the times of Emperor Constantine, who called it the venerable day of the sun. He also called it the invincible sun. You see, he was a sun worshiper, so now, because he was a politician, he sees Christians all over the empire, so he says, hey, how can I join Christians and pagans? He says, hey, the pagans keep the first day of the week in honor of the sun, and Christians, you know, they're starting to keep the, the day of Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Maybe we can merge the two. And this can be shown to be true historically. Well, let me ask you this question. Should the observance of Sunday be guaranteed by civil legislation? In other words, should the church appeal to the state so that the state will guarantee that people can keep Sunday or Saturday, for that matter, as a day of rest? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. Matthew chapter 22 and verses 21 and 22. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar, this is Jesus speaking, the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. To whom does the Sabbath belong? To Caesar or to God? The Sabbath belongs to God. So should Caesar get involved in mandating worship on Sunday and guaranteeing it by civil legislation? Absolutely not. By the way, the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, Congress can't make any law having to do with establishing religion or forbidding the free exercise of religion. The state should be independent from the religion business. It's here to rule in civil matters. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Render therefore to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And by the way, that's what's represented by the two horns like a lamb, which we studied about. Remember the, the beast that rose from the earth that had two horns like a lamb? Two kingdoms in one nation. The United States recognizes two kingdoms, the kingdom of the church and the kingdom of the state, but separate from one another. What does John Paul II say? in Dies Domini about the state getting involved in legislating the day of worship. Notice paragraph 66. He's quoting or referring to Pope Leo XIII. Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical Rerum Novarum, spoke of Sunday rest as a worker's right which the state must guarantee. Must the state guarantee the observance of Sunday? Absolutely not. And by the way, I'm not going to read it, but in this same document, Pope John Paul II extols and praises the first Sunday law that was written by Constantine in the year 321. He says, this is the way that it should be done. And I'm paraphrasing him. Notice paragraph 67. Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. So he's saying that Christians should fight for legislation to make sure 
that everyone can keep Sunday holy. That is not biblical. Actually, as we've studied before, it was a union of church and state that led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They're to remain separate. They are not to be together. Now here comes another question. Who changed the day of worship? Now, Pope John Paul II does a valiant effort. He puts forth a valiant effort to try and prove that the change was already contemplated in the New Testament. He uses the same Bible verses that Protestants use. Well, Jesus resurrected the first day of the week. You know, Jesus appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus on Sunday. You know, Jesus appeared to the apostles on Sunday night in the upper room. You know, and, and the apostle Paul, you know, he had this prayer meeting service in Acts chapter 20 where it was, it was an e evening meeting on the first day of the week, it says. And also, the Apostle Paul said that we're supposed to take our tithes and offerings to the church on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. But folks, all of those texts has been, have been more than satisfactorily answered by Sam Bakioki in his book, From Sabbath to Sunday. And if I had the time, I would go into that. Just because Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week does not make the day holy. Nowhere does the Bible say that the day is holy because Jesus resurrected that day. Nowhere does it say we're supposed to go to church. That meeting that Paul held, according to Acts chapter 20, was an extraordinary meeting because he was leaving the next day. The people wanted to continue hearing him preach. And by the way, it was not a meeting on Sunday night. It was a meeting on Saturday night. I don't have time to show you that. And, and when people use 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, and they say that Paul was saying to take your offering to the church, in fact, it says that everyone was supposed to lay aside at home a certain sum the first day of the week. That's the way many versions translate it. The fact is the Bible tells us, folks, that God sanctified and blessed the Sabbath because he rested on the Sabbath. In order for Sunday to be blessed and sanctified, God would have had to have rested on Sunday. And Jesus didn't rest on Sunday. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. Now, as you read this document carefully, you soon discover that John Paul II actually attributes the change to tradition and to Christians. Now, you have to read carefully. I think what he's doing, or what he did in this uh, letter that he wrote, is that he wanted to appeal to Protestants. You see, Catholics traditionally have not used these verses from the Bible. Jesus resurrected the first day. He appeared to the disciples on Sunday night. And, you know, Paul had this meeting on, sun on Saturday night, which they say is Sunday night. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to take your money to the church on Sunday, every first day of the week. You know. Catholics never used to use these verses. They always used to say, the church changed it. The papacy changed it by the authority that God gave them. But John Paul II was a very ecumenical pope. And so he uses the verses that Protestants use in order to say, hey, I'm on your side. But when you read the document carefully, he actually reveals whom it was that changed the day. Notice paragraph 6. It seems more necessary than ever to recover the deep doctrinal foundations underlying the church's precept. Speaking about Sunday. So whose precept is it? The church's precept. And then he continues saying that in keeping Sunday, we follow in the footsteps of the age-old tradition of the church. Notice paragraph 18. He says, Christians made the first day after the Sabbath a festive day. Excuse me, who did it? God? No. He says, Christians made the first day after the Sabbath a festive day, for that was the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. And who gave Christians to make the right to make that change? Interestingly enough, he doesn't say the Bible. He says Christians. By the way, as you read Dies Domini, it becomes a very frustrating document because John Paul II argues mostly 
from a philosophical perspective. He's a philosopher. And so he just philosophizes, you know, and, and he's, he reasons, he uses human reason to, to try and prove that Sunday is the day of rest, but he has no, thus saith the Lord from Scripture. So he says in paragraph 27, Christian reflection and pastoral practice changed it. Since when does Christian reflection change the day of worship? Since when does pastoral practice have a right to change the day of worship? Paragraph 63, he says, Christians called as they are to proclaim the liberation won by the blood of Christ felt, who felt? Christians, right? Felt that they had the authority to transfer the meaning of the Sabbath to the day of the resurrection. Who gave Christians such a right? Only God would have the right to change the day. And if the papacy claims to have made the change, they must claim that they have the power and prerogatives of God. That's why 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the man of sin sits in the temple of God, which is the church, showing himself that he is God. Notice paragraph 81. He says, the spiritual and pastoral riches of Sunday as it has been handed on to us by tradition are truly great. Are you catching as you read carefully where he says the change comes from? He can provide no verse from the Bible that justifies the change whatsoever. He appeals to history as he interprets it. He appeals to arguments from reason. He appeals to philosophical arguments. But never can he present a text where thus saith the Lord. Listen, folks, if we're going to change the day that we worship upon we better have a thus saith the Lord. A few years ago, I was speaking in Argentina. It was at a Seventh-day Adventist university, but uh, there were many students who were not Seventh-day Adventists who were attending. And one evening I preached a sermon on the harlot of Revelation 17. And I said, tonight I'm going to preach this sermon about the harlot of Revelation 17. I'm going to give you all of the characteristics, but I'm not going to tell you what system this applies to. But you're going to know, I said, by the characteristics, which system in the world this harlot is referring to. And so I preached the sermon. I gave, you know, a, a woman represents a church, a harlot woman is a fallen church. She sits upon many waters, which means it's a world church. She fornicates with the kings of the church, which means that she's involved in politics. She's decked with gold and silver and precious stones, you know, so she must be a very rich church that maj majors in these materials. You know, she has daughters because she's called the mother of harlots, daughters that were born from her. And so I went all through all of the characteristics, and I never identified what system it was referring to. The next morning, I was in, uh, in a room where I had interviews with students. They could come and they could uh, ask questions and I would pray for them. They would have prayer requests. This woman came in, this, actually she was a young lady, and she says, uh, Pastor, I want you to know that you offended me last night. I looked at her and I said, really, I offended you? Why did I offend you? She said, well, you didn't offend me. You offended my church. I looked at her and I said, but I don't remember mentioning the name of any church last night. She says, no, you didn't mention the name, but by all of the characteristics, we knew you were talking about the Roman Catholic Church. So I looked at her and I said, hey, if all I had to give you was the characteristics, and by the characteristics, you reached the conclusion without me having to tell you, maybe you should pay attention. And then I asked her a question. I said, which day of the week are we supposed to go to church and worship? She says, on Sunday. I said, oh, really? Why? 
She says, because that's what the Bible says. I said, really, where? She says, well, the church has told us. The Bible says that we're supposed to keep Sunday. I said, have you ever read the Ten Commandments in the Roman Catholic Bible? She says, well, I can't remember reading them. I said, well, uh, how about you get a Roman Catholic Bible and you read Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, in your own Roman Catholic Bible? She says, what difference would it make? I said, if you read it in there, you're going to find that it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and it's going to tell you that the Sabbath is the seventh day. She says, well, Sunday is the seventh day. I said, oh, really? Which day of the week did Jesus resurrect? She says, oh, he resurrected on the first day of the week. I said, really? And what, is, what day was the first day of the week? She says, Sunday. So I said, okay, so then the seventh day isn't Sunday. So oh, things started dawning. So I said, go read it. In your own Roman Catholic Bible, it says that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. I said, so who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe your Roman Catholic Bible? Or are you, going, are you going to believe your Roman Catholic Pope? And she paused for the longest moment of time. And she said, I'm confused. I don't know how to resolve this. She says, I'm going to go talk to my bishop. And I told her, go talk to him. But I'm going to tell you what he's going to tell you. He's not going to be able to give you any verse in the Bible that says that the day was changed. But he's going to say that Jesus gave authority to the church to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. She left. To this day, I don't know what happened with this lady. I pray to God that when she met with her bishop, if she did, that she asked additional questions and she came to accept the truth as it's found in the Bible. But I don't know. So my question to Roman Catholics is, whose authority do you accept? The authority of your Roman Catholic Bible and the fourth commandment that's in there? Or do you accept the authority of Dies Domini? Yours is the choice. And I say to Protestants, do you accept the testimony of the Bible that the Sabbath was made at creation, it was blessed and sanctified by God, or will you observe the first day of the week, which never the Bible says was made holy by God, never says it was blessed by God, never is it called God's holy day, will you keep that day thinking that you're keeping it because the Bible teaches it, but you're really keeping it because it has been handed down by the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. This is where the choice is in the end time, folks. The choice in the end time is between the seal of God and the mark of the beast. It's between one day and another. The seal of God is the Sabbath. The mark of the beast is the first day of the week. You say, oh, you're saying then that the whole world is going to be divided by a day? Let me tell you, the day is only the means by which God will test you to see whose authority you accept, who you are loyal to. Do you remember that God placed a tree in the Garden of Eden known as a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of all of the trees of the garden. Like he says to us, you can work six days and do all of your labor. But God said, don't you eat from that tree. He was saying, that tree is off limits to you. That's my tree. That's not yours. Was the test over a tree? No. The tree was only, the purpose of the tree was only to test Adam and Eve to see whether they would be loyal to him or loyal to Satan. Whether they would accept God's authority or whether they would accept the devil's authority. The external tree was the means of testing to whom they would be loyal. And so at the end of time, the day of worship is the way in which God is going to test people to say, see to whom they will be loyal and whose authority they accept. 
if you in the end time accept the authority of the beast, you will receive his day of worship. You will keep the first day of the week. The Bible says that those who receive the mark of the beast will receive the wrath of God. That's why this is such an important issue. I want to end with a quotation from that classic book, The Great Controversy, page 53. Here Ellen White speaks about the process of how Sunday was adopted. She says, the arch deceiver had not contemplated this work. He was resolved to gather the Christian world under his banner and to exercise his power through his vice regent, the proud pontiff who claimed to be the representative of Christ. In other words, vicarious Philly Day. We'll study that later on. Through half-converted pagans, ambitious prelates, and world-loving churchmen, he accomplished his purpose. Vast councils were head, held from time to time in which the dignitaries of the church were convened from all the world. In nearly every council, the Sabbath which God instituted was pressed down a little lower while the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Thus the pagan festival came finally to be honored as a divine institution while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be accursed. This can be proven to be historically true and Sam Bakioki has done it in his publications. Folks, the bottom line is this. Will I accept the authority of God and reveal it by keeping his Sabbath and receiving his seal? Or will I accept the authority of the beast and receive his sign, which is the observance of the first day of the week?